Thank you, Vivian, Pratik, for inviting me here. Uh, this is my first visit to India. Okay, that was just to check if you are awake. <laughs> the last talk of the day, and so this is to wake you up, so I'm glad. Okay, but thank you nonetheless because it's always great to be back home and uh, also very nice to be back to RIC where I spent wonderful one year, first year of my PhD. So it's uh, great to be here. So um, I am going to be talking about CGM, but with focus on our own thinking because of our special vantage point, we can actually do the kind of work which is very, very difficult to do for external galaxies in X-rays. And that's because X-ray telescopes are tiny. That's my effective area, big channel, okay? So this is why um, we have great advantage working with uh, the Milky Way. So uh, we already talked about why study this. Uh, we hadn't talked about gradient interaction yesterday, so I kept this big uh, figure, but today we have covered it. At low redshift, variants are missing at all scales, including uh, the low redshift entire universe is missing variants, which is supposed to be in the grid. We have a paper coming out of our low redshift grid next week in Nature, and I'm embargoed to talk about it, so I won't. Uh, so, but what we are talking about now is galaxies are also missing and their mass and uh, the question of course is where is the mass and we have talked about we have seen lots of simulations that this mass most of the mass of a galaxy is believed to be in an extended circumgalactic medium extending to uh, hundreds of uh, kiloparsec and the extent and the properties of the circumgalactic medium depends maybe on the amount of heat so the properties of the circumgalactic medium are really intimately related to the formation and evolution of a galaxy, and so uh, understanding CGM therefore uh, serves a multitude of purposes. And so, what is the temperature of this hard gas that we expected to exist? And again, this is from the same simulations I'm showing you here: the temperature density diagram that most of the uh, uh, mass the galaxy is supposed to be in this hot warm hot phase at low densities which is true both uh, cases in low and high feedback mode so because this gas is expected to be very hot we have the x-ray advantage because the gas even though mostly ionized you still have very high highly ionized um, uh, atoms which actually produce X-ray absorption objects, okay, in uh, 07, 08. So we'll talk about that later. So we expect to have this hot gas uh, around galaxies, including our Milky Way, and we kind of knew that way back in Rosa data, okay. So if you look at the all-star map in the sub-X-ray regime, around quantum kV uh, based from Rosa, we knew that there is really a halo emission. However, Rosette did not have the spectral resolution to resolve out the multiple components which make this diffuse X-ray emission that we observe, okay? So, until very recently, until I got into this business, I really didn't know how very complicated this thing is. I do extragalactic uh, astronomy, and if I had to study the halo of a galaxy, I had to worry about solar wind charge exchange, who knew? And so these are the complications that we could not deal with with that. And it's only now that we really understand what is the contribution from solar wind charge exchange from the local bubble, the extra galactic unresolved point sources, and we take out a needle from the haystack to find out what really the galactic halo contribution is. And uh, this was very nicely done uh, in last few years by Henry and Shelton, and they really mapped out uh, the halo emission uh, from the Milky Way. And this is from emission from oxygen 7 and oxygen 8. Again, really the kind of ions you expect in emission. Uh, Robin Shelton, uh, I really have to say, does excellent 
well, I don't think she gets as much credit for it. So I really like to point her work out. So this is emission, so wonderful. But emission and the observations tell you only so much. It uh, does not allow us to really uh, uh, figure out what are the other or the, the physical parameters of uh, the gas that's producing emission. And that's because emission measure really uh, depends on the square of the density and the pathway of the Milky Way halo, right? So we don't know independently how big the halo is, what its density is, what its mass is. And this is true not just for the Milky Way halo, but it's all about all emission observations. So we saw yesterday all these beautiful outflow images coming of M82 and other galaxies, but emission only observations only throw a certain parameter space where your emissivity is high, your density is high. So always keep that in mind when we um, try to derive properties of galaxies based on emission only. And which is why absorption line spectroscopy is important because now it shows nearest gas wherever that is there, okay? And now absorption line studies measure column densities, which is just the product of density times pathway. And so when you mix, when you combine these two measurements, we can resolve the degeneracy and actually independently measure densities and path lengths, which is exactly what we did. And for those of us who are not used to the X-ray spectra, I'm putting an example here of a sat line toward Mercurian 421. Not too different, really, uh, from uh, X UV spectra. If you have good enough signal to noise, you have continuum and you have absorption line. In particular, the strongest absorption line you expect is oxygen 7 K alpha line, which is exactly at 21.602 angstrom as you expect, okay? And here we see, in addition to oxygen 7 K alpha, you also see K beta, oxygen 8, and so you can figure out what is, uh, what are the properties of uh, Milky Way uh, CDM. Okay, so, this is what we then did, that since the emission observations existed, as I showed uh, previously, what we did is looked at a range of sight lines going through the Milky Way halo and figured out their absorption line properties, combined them with the emission properties to derive the properties of the Milky Way CGM. And what we found, as I was mentioning earlier yesterday, that the density we derive here uh, under the assumption of constant density, I should clarify, is that it is of the order of a couple of times, 10 to the minus uh, 4 per century. The cube, uh, if we assume a uh, metallicity of a third solar, which is very reasonable thing to assume, then the Milky Way halo is definitely very extended over 130 kiloparsec, and the mass content is over six times 10 to the power 10 solar masses. So at least as much as the mass in uh, the disk of the Milky Way containing um, uh, stars and the interstellar medium. This is what we, um, this and some, the, some of the work that I'll be talking about is what we have in Gupta et al. papers, a series of papers led by Anjali Gupta, okay, who was my postdoc. Um, so this is what I want you to take away. Yeah. Yeah, so in the first paper where these numbers I'm talking about, we are only considering sky averages. So, you know, we have multiple sight lines, which are not exactly the same from where the emission measure is measured, and that's what we have been doing in subsequent papers. But the first paper, what the num these numbers correspond to are average over the whole sky emission and average over the whole sky absorption. So this is what the takeaway from uh, our work is that if this is the uh, Milky Way disk, the metallic cloud, and if I must, the, the uh, M82 type 
outflows would be in this region. But what we do see is a very extended uh, halo around Milky Way as detected in this. Okay, so this is a pair. This is again a figure we uh, saw this morning that um, from Fang et al. Well, this is the density profiles, and this is the Moller and Bullock profile, um, which is uh, a profile for hydrostatic equilibrium in the MSW halo. And these data bonds are from Gravich uh, um, and Putnam from the uh, rampation stripping of uh, satellite galaxies. Interestingly, our numbers are. Two times ten to the minus four are very similar to that. Yes. Yes. I think that's no. Uh, yes. Correct. Thank you. Uh, so, it, so this was kind of encouraging because you know when we first got our result, is like. Are all the numbers making sense? So seeing this same paper was also very encouraging for us. That completely different determination of what the densities are uh, ended up being similar to what we had found. But as I said, in uh, first we had assumed just constant density model as a step one. We had not really fit any profile, which we did sub subsequently. But given how flat the Waller and Muller profile, that assumption you already realized it wasn't a bad one at all. And then, of course, in the subsequent paper, we kept uh, trying to determine how robust this result is, whether our assumptions uh, made any sense. One of the first things that people were saying is, oh, you assume constant density, but what about different uh, profiles? And, but it's actually no problem. I have showed in one of these papers that you can show mathematically rigorously that no matter what profile you consider, and whether you consider clumping or disk contribution, whatever, whatever we got, assuming constant density actually gives a lower limit on mass. But nonetheless, everybody else wants models, so we did better model profiles. Uh, as we were going along and then trying to do dips in sightlines with both emission and absorption. Now, in a given sightline, okay, that's the uh, way forward what we are doing is instead of averaging over the whole sky, now we are going sightline by sightline so that absorption and emission, absorption and emission, absorption and emission, and then maybe we should average or look for the anisotropy. That's what we are doing. These are the results from our a better model, it remains extended uh, and low density medium. Again, here is the Frank et al. curve. This particular sunshine had um, towards the high end of the distribution of the emission measure. So we knew this was more denser gas or shorter pathways. So it even lies somewhere in the ballpark. But uh, uh, interesting anyway. The other question was well, you're combining emission and absorption results, but are they really at the same temperature? And sure, they are. We knew that they are. Uh, we could exactly measure the temperatures. And this is again in one of the science lines we actually fitted the entire spectrum uh, with our uh, phase model and got very precise temperature measurements of log T of 10 to the uh, temperature of over 10 to the power 6.33. And the uh, emission uh, measurements also gave us a very precise temperature of about the same thing. So yes, we are comparing apples with apples. That's not a worry at all. And this is another thing I want to point out about doing X-ray observations is that we have two ionization states of a single element, so like oxygen 7 and 8. So we can determine the temperature precisely. We can do the ionization correction precisely. So this is what an independent result. It doesn't matter what the uh, background is or any other thing, whether which kind of a model you are considering. Yes. Yes, right. 
Now we are considering constant temperature. We do not have power yet to determine all parameters simultaneously, but as we will extend our data, we will try to see whether that step assumption is the correct one. And that's the kind of um, step forward we are doing. There is still lots of work to do, luckily. <laughs> uh, so, the other uh, issue that we want to do, uh, think about is that, uh, again, based on uh, feedback we got, is that is the zero absorption mostly coming from the galactic disk? And uh, that is a very good question. And we knew that it isn't because what we did is we looked for the equivalent width of our lines. Uh, as a function of sine b. Like if it was mostly coming from the disk of our galaxy, we should clearly see the dependence with sine b. And even though we knew that our sight lines were all very high galactic latitude sight lines, they will not have uh, any significant contribution to the disk. Showing this was important to satisfy people. So great, we did that. But nonetheless, we thought, you know what? Let's just measure the contribution from the disk so that we don't have to worry about this question ever again. So what we did is that, in addition to our high galactic latitude sight lines, we also included some galactic sight lines. We also had some little bit higher galactic latitude, some halo stars, which is similar to, I think, what is the plan to do next. And we actually looked at the absorption through the galaxy, we model that with some exponential density profile. We included that in our sight lines uh, to the extra galactic ones so that we are really probing CGM. And now we clearly know, yes, there is really a lot of gas uh, absorption that we are seeing from the CGM. It's not from the galactic. But by doing this exercise, we found something very funny that we were not looking for. And when we put a better model to just uh, fit our data on absorption line uh, column density, our symmetric beta model, by symmetric I mean centered on R equal to zero at the galactic center, just didn't work. And now I'm talking only absorption, not of emission and absorption, okay? So it just didn't work. And what did work, however, if we put an offset to the center, okay? So some kind of a shift radius. And that actually gave us the best chi square. So if actually we assumed in the better model that there is an offset about five, six kiloparsec, then um, the a better model to all the science lines fit much better. This was actually weird because what we basically found is that, yes, both the plane and halo have gas filled with million degree gas. Halo does have a significant fraction of the absorption we see does come from the CGM, but in the galaxy, there is a hole in the middle. And this was just so weird that we kept checking this result. We thought we must have done something wrong until we realized, ah, there are Fermi bubbles. And so this is something that we had not really uh, thought of before. We were definitely not looking for it. But accidentally, we have found a signatures of the magnificent structures of our galaxy, the Fermi bubbles. We know most likely they were produced by some past Asian activity. And so maybe that's what we are actually seeing. We saw pictures of Fermi bubbles before. Here are some simulations uh, found after having accidentally discovered it that you really do have very hot gas uh, in shelves around these uh, Fermi bubbles. The temperature and density is really uh, consistent what we, with what we found. So basically, this is these are the results of that work as I um, mentioned to uh, earlier that the number density distribution is again is showing you the emitting gas has densities of the order of 10 to the minus 4, very similar to what we had found. So this is, um, this is uh, I thought was proper thing to discuss here in the bubble meeting. So um, 
we also heard about, in addition to the missing barium problem, a missing metals problem. And so what that problem is, is that if you consider the metal mass in the universe as produced over the entire history of the universe, uh, as a function of the stellar mass of a galaxy, this line shows what your uh, metal content in the universe should be. And if you add up all these sources of uh, metals in, as we observe, then they fall short of what is produced in the universe. That's what the missing metals problem that was I think discussed by uh, Jeff. So now, when we observe the CGM of the Milky Way, we are observing oxygen. So obviously, we are observing metals. So if I count how much that contributes to my, my, my number comes somewhere here, it definitely uh, alleviates this problem somewhat, but doesn't totally uh, take care of it. So this is where the data stands uh, currently. So and uh, going ahead, like I said uh, already, uh, we have been, uh, to begin with, uh, step one, we had considered average properties of the Milky Way halo, uh, but now we are actually probing the anisotropy of Milky Way halo by going by cyclone to cyclone to cyclone and doing emission and absorption measurements in different directions and then look for whether that anisotropy has any connection to the larger scale environment of a galaxy within the group towards Andromeda. Is there any difference at all? We can actually finally beginning to go uh, in the direction where when we're moving from, oh, we detected CGM to maybe really look at a bigger picture than that. And we are uh, already, as I showed, oops, uh, as I showed, considering different temperature and density profiles, we will go get to temperature profiles soon, uh, hopefully, uh, and this we, we are considering already. The Antarctic said they have different profiles that definitely are welcome to try uh, all different things. We will be including clumping in the modeling uh, or uh, as we go ahead. And of course, you know, I really do like to think of myself as a multivalent astronomer. So I would like to, in fact, uh, probe multi-phase medium, taking uh, into account other uh, different temperatures. Uh, in that regard, I just want to uh, highlight a beautiful, beautiful <coughs> HSC cost spectrum we uh, took recently. Uh, this uh, is a very high signal to noise spectrum of one of the cost payloads uh, sight lines. You can see it's absolutely rich and beautiful. We are, um, uh, our, one of our students, Kathy Lucas, has uh, produced this uh, nice um, paper which we should be soon uh, submitting. So I just wanted to uh, advertise her work. And other, um, uh, one of the things that I just put after we discussed this a uh, few talks ago, is really where the O6 is coming from. And one of the diagnostics for O6, as uh, was discussed uh, earlier, was the nitrogen 5 to oxygen 6 ratio. And uh, if in this plot, it is carbon 4 to oxygen 6 versus nitrogen 5 to uh, oxygen 6. And on this plot, these different O6 production mecha uh, mechanisms like the turbulent mixing, radiative cooling, and conductive heating are included. So um, this is where our data show, but this cyclone passes through di two different uh, CGMs of two different galaxies, and this is where our data lies. We have no information on carbon four, but the high signal to noise that we uh, obtained for this site line actually gave us um, a detection of nitrogen 5, which was not there before, allowing us to put uh, our data on this plot. And uh, there is also some modified uh, radiative cooling model that recently come from uh, Bart Walker. And looks like both these CGMs uh, have O6 consistent with being produced from um, uh, radiative cooling uh, model, but 
then just uh, just that drupal would be submitted like within hopefully within the next one and just under the advertisement of uh, work of my under the student uh, Sanskrit that's just joined us last year she has done great work on this uh, this is Suzaku observations of discovery of Horsidium in an external galaxy. Like I said, the X-ray detections of external galaxies has been is very very hard because we had to work with small telescopes. Um, but we Suzaku is really good for this because of its large field of view. We can do the spectral decomposition that was that is necessary to isolate the CGM signal with that. And so that's why we, we uh, observed an uh, L star, star forming galaxy with Suzaku. And uh, we actually have j j just three sigma results, but nonetheless, it is there. Uh, and so that again is uh, just to advertise some of this work. And this also is really done. Another paper coming this is it this one person. Okay, thank you. That's exactly what we solve for. That's the pattern. 
That's what we solve for. This is what oh, we managed to do. Okay. Yeah, that itself tells you that it's not from the test, but then we did many more things to really make sure that's what it is. What's the main uh, uh, your uh, beta models for the whole side are the third basis power and equator and thermal models. What's the sorry, what's the reference to that? And and um, what, what what are the uncertainties on the geometry of the model? So I, I I think that might be best seen with this transfer curve. Yeah. So you know, this is where your minimum transfer is you can make it whatever one sigma two sigma. It's around the best fit is 5.6, I would say, the sulfur is about 1.5. Where is this published? This is Nikas Retal 2016. Yeah, so following on from Roman's question about the size of the Milky Way hot halo. One thing I noticed is you showed the emission measures don't depend on sine b, right? It, it seemed like, in other words, you get the same amount at different latitudes. So that's why it's, un I don't understand how you get a distant size out of that. Uh, do you have, to, you have to do some model dependent profile? No, no. Even if you don't do any profiling, but supposing you have one value of emission measure and one value of column density, then together you can solve for density and time. Okay, all right. So That's it doesn't matter what the latitude is. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Suppose um, a large brown bubble was a short heated layer. Um, let's say the pressure gap goes up by a factor of two, so that you want some oxygen in the water and you have a heat or maybe some uh, ions of iron. So is there any possibility to put um, I would love to, but you know, I guess Andrew Fox has done other ions in UV in X rays. Uh, if I really, if, if, you, if you had a very, very high signal to noise, which would mean, I guess, uh, towards a bright ray, that it would mean several megaseconds of trending time. That is a possibility of seeing other uh, ionization transitions. But we don't have that. Right, but the grating spectrum that you know it doesn't extend to hard X-rays. It is only there for the soft X-ray. 